Hello! Ah, mystery boxes from the archive of the Cambridge Museum for Computing History. They are the best of all the boxes. Also, they're very dusty. Uh, just thought I'd point that out because they're in an archive. Right, what's inside this one? It is... Oh, blimey. Um, yes! <laughs> right, let's, let's have a look and see if I can piece together what actually this stuff is. This is uh, Amstrad. Fascinating. Amstrad PCW8256 test PCB. I don't know if you can uh, see that at home there. So, this is a test PCB for an Amstrad PCW8256. What does it test? I don't know. Um, a, a PCW8265, I believe, was their like, green screen word processor thing. If you are of a certain age, they were the word processors in the United Kingdom. You will have come across them, you will have sworn at them, but secretly... You will have loved them. If you're American, you've probably never heard the bloody things. Amstrad stands for Alan Michael Sugar Trading. Uh, it's the company started by Alan Sugar, who went on to run the UK version of The Apprentice. If you are American and interested in such things, or Canadian and interested in such things, or you're just English and not very old, and are interested in such things, do you see where I'm going with this? Anyway, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what that's for. Simple as that, I'm afraid. Probably couldn't find out even if I looked it up. But I'm not going to bother. I'm instead going to look at dun, 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 this, because this is familiar and I cannot for the life of me place what it is. It's really annoying me. Um, it's a box. What on earth is this? CST. Well, that's uh, Cambridge Systems Technology. QDisc. QDisc? QDisc. So it's a disc... Uh, yeah. So it's an adapter so you can plug a disc drive into something and presumably a Sinclair QL because Cambridge is Sinclair and it's got Q before it. So I would guess... That is a Sinclair QL distro thing. If you don't know what QL is, I'm not surprised. They weren't very successful. Um, basically, it was uh, sort of what Sir Clive Sinclair did after the ZX Spectrum. QL stood for Quantum Leap, because it was supposed to be a great leap into the future. Instead, it was a great leap into debt. Harsh, but true. Right, what's next? I don't know. Um, ah, it's one of these. I don't know what that is. I... I have genuinely no idea what this is, what it would plug into, or what it would do. It looks very pretty, and it fits over something as well, but no, that is not something I recognise. Any of you old computer heads in the comments are going to have to give the answer to that one, because I have not a flipping clue, Governor. Um, it looks like something that plugs into something, then there's nothing else that plugs into... Are those contacts something? I don't know. I have no idea. Could be something Sinclair as an expectory though, because it's black with lines, which was their kind of uh, trademark design. But uh, no, no idea, I'm afraid. So we come on to this. Is this what I think it is? Typed. Oh, thank goodness, it says at the back. It's a Type 2. Right. DKtronics, or Ducktronics, as I'm going to call it now to annoy anybody in the entire world, were a manufacturer of peripherals for various computers, uh, Spectrum especially, and this is a replacement keyboard for the ZX Spectrum. Um, I can't remember, did the Spectrum go inside it? No, it doesn't. From a quick look at it, I would have said it plugs in many plugs on the back. All, as far as I can tell, incorrectly labelled. It's like the PCB should be higher up than it actually is. Mm. Oh, God. Like the bottom's falling out. Um, but, yeah, basically, if you don't know the ZX Spectrum keyboard, it was just grotesque. They were t absolutely terrible on the Spectrum and the Spectrum Plus for different reasons. This is a much nicer thing to type on. It's still not great. And also, rather than having something etched onto the keys, there's just stickers on each key telling you what they are. Presumably that's so they could sell the same box for the... Commodore 64 or something, I don't know. I mean, the Commodore 64 keyboard was a lot better than the Spectrum, generally. Although they, it was still a bit crap. They were very spongy keys. You had to push them in like a mile. But this is much nicer to type on. It's weird. I've seen many pictures of these over the years, and never actually typed on one. No, it's not great. Not great, but it has all these functions. And it has a numerical keypad, which, if you were doing a lot of uh, data entry, probably very useful. Right. What else have we got, apart from bubble wrap? Oh, my God. Networking interface! They really want you to know that. Look at it. Networking interface! My goodness. This is just an early modem uh, for connecting up to what we laughably called the internet at the time. This is suitable for Apple, BBC, Commodore, ACT, 380Z, IBM PC, TRS-80i. Good God, all your ancient computers of a certain time. And literally... It used pulse dialing, and you stuck your phone receiver on it. If you see that in old films, that's not a joke or something. That is actually how they used to work back in the day. Uh, I have no idea what it's like to use one, and probably never will. Oh, my goodness. And here is a micro-genius. 
computer game like this is like a no this is a Fama clone, isn't it? Judging by the um, yeah, I would have said it is. Judging by the, it could be a Sega one, but it's basically something that plays cartridges it shouldn't. It's been naughty. It shouldn't really be doing this kind of thing at all. They haven't got the license, but we'll let them off because they're ancient and everything's gone a really horrible colour. There's one of the joy pads with it. Oh my god, look at that. It's an interestingly shaped device, to say the least. It doesn't feel very nice. Yeah, you can't get a definite direction on it, and the buttons are painful. They're um, going in rather than out, which is... Uh, is that convex or concave? I can never remember. Concave, we'll call it, because cave sounds like something that's going in somewhere. <laughs> Could be wrong. And finally, here's a Playmobil bag. Is there a Playmobil in here? I don't know, but I'm going to handle this very carefully. Oh my goggly goodness. It's just a mass of... Good God, it's some boards. It's just a mass of wires, of rewiring things. Well, I've got genuinely no idea what that is. I don't want to look in case I break it, so that's going back in very, very carefully. Blimey. Mystery box time, picked at random, because we've run out of recommendations. OK. Inside, lots of fun things, right? We have picked well, because I'm sure some of these are just full of, like, disk drive adapters or something. Right, the, ooh. See, my mind was immediately drawn to this uh, very nice-looking handheld device. I discover I have no clue what it is. Right, Xerox Park is written on it, but Park is a company that owned by Xerox, I believe, or part of it or something. That's That doesn't appear to be anything. It's not a joystick or any sort of controller. You've got three buttons. Hold it in the hand, so yeah, up, down and centre. So presumably there's a menu system. You go through with those and then select with the middle. I have genuinely no idea what it is. It seems to have infrared on the top and bottom, some sort of charging port and something that may be something that connects onto a belt. See, whilst I say it could be something like an early iPod or something, it's clearly not. It's just something for business use, I would have thought. It looks very rugged. Um, but as for what it's used for, I have not a clue. Leave us a comment if you know, and nobody will care, because comments, eh? Right, um, these are quite obviously, well, I say quite obviously, but then I wasn't sure, but then I saw the logo. Um, these are Dragon 32 controllers, which I believe I mentioned briefly in a previous uh, box about the Dragon 32. Yeah, look at the size of the movement on these things. My understanding is, although I uh, could be wrong on this, that they were digital only, they weren't actually analogue, um, so it's just really horrible to use them. Maybe they could handle analogue input. There's one button and a little dragon logo on the bottom. I've never actually seen ones of this type where it's made with a sort of stick you hold in the hand. You use your hands, it's like a baby's toy. That was Back to the Future. Um, but yeah, Dragon 32 controls are a pain in the bum, because nearly all computers of the time use these nine-pin connectors, and the Dragon 32 had these... Uh, weird round sort of din plugs. But there we go. Put those over there and look at whatever the frickin' hell this thing is! Oh, it's port extender. There we are. So I couldn't tell you which computer it's for. Probably BBC Micro or something. Plug it in the back and then your one port has become four. And you are now the king of the world and may have executed anybody who looks at you funny. So, you know, it's worth quite a bit, that. And we've got dip switches to turn them on and off as well. Yeah, that's nifty. Right, up there it goes. Uh, here is an acorn book. That's nice. What is this? I don't know. For installing a printer on an acorn and electron or something? No idea. I shall put that to one side and use it for later bedtime reading. No, I won't. Here's a box. Texas Instruments box, num lot number 225, which means it's been auctioned at some point. What on earth is this? Oh, there's multiple things. It's a speech synthesizer unit for, I would presume, a Texas Instruments computer, a TI. I did not know such a thing existed. That's interesting, because I always use synthesized speech from old 8-bit computers and some 16-bits at the end of videos, you know, where it goes, subscribe for more, or subscribe for more, if I'm using one of the really low-quality ones. Um, I didn't know the TI did it. Um, it could be using existing software that sounds the same as others, but that's fascinating. I'm going to look into that later and maybe add that to my list of uh, awful noises you get at the end of videos. I can't get this thing back on. It's annoying me. Get back in your box, you. There we are. I'm scared it'll whisper to me about all the cheeses of the world and drive me mad. Right. SM... no, 8 megabyte Game Wizard. What? Oh, it's, it's a PCI graphics accelerator utilising 3DFX Voodoo 2 technology. My God, remember that. But it's for the Mac. I did not know um, they made uh, Voodoo 2s for the Mac. Well, I've learned something today then. 3DFX absolutely massacred the rest of the market when it came to um, 
3D accelerators, and then they kind of disappeared. I think Nvidia bought them, if I remember. There's all sorts of gums in here I don't understand. Well, that uh, looks like a compact flash card thing. No, it isn't. It's for sodium RAM, uh, laptop RAM. I don't know. I'm confused now. That's going to go back in the box and be put to one side. Next up, hmm, I'm going to go for electronic cue ball. I I have one of these, I think, but I don't have the box. Alex Higgins, sorry, I'll turn it so you can actually see it. Alex Higgins plays electronic cue ball. No, he's playing actual snooker. Um, it doesn't even look like he's playing pool. Actually, it looks like he's playing snooker. You have lied to us, Palatoy Palatronics. Right on the button, yeah, with your lies. Um, here, here's Alex Hurricane Kane Higgins for you there. He was a very famous uh, snooker player, very popular in the UK. He was seen as a, it was seen as a bit of a posh sport um, snooker, but uh, he was a working class lad, done good, which was nice. Less good is I think he became alcoholic and it seriously affected his health. I don't even know if he's alive to this day, which is slightly depressing. But this was sold for two pound fifty at one point, so you know that makes up for it. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah. I suspect this is actually like an American design that they just rebranded. You've got a lot of that. Yep, there's not many very different lights on there. It's the little bulbs. Select a few, press a button, play something that's vaguely like pool but cost quite a lot of money at the time, I imagine. Ah, uh, those were the days. Yeah, that gives you an idea of what it was like to play that. I'm also going to summarise what it was like to play that as a noise. That should give you a better impression. Right. Got that to one side, because I'm not in this one. It's a Radofin! Dun, 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 dun. Radofin is one of the few consoles where hunting men in weird hats would uh, fire powder puffs at women playing tennis. It was famous for it. There's a man who's been skinned alive playing football, which is always nice. And as that volleyball from Spalding, I would guess so. Some sort of ice hockey and John McEnroe or something. Right, there, oh man, the stories these. I own so many of these bloody things, right? Uh, the Radofin is how I usually refer to them. I couldn't even tell you who originally made them, but uh, the whole guts of them were just repeatedly used by different uh, manufacturers. This is an early one that only has the awful built-in TV games nonsense, which are basically all crap variants of Pong, as you can uh, see. Quite amply provided in front of your face there. Um, they're all a bit shite, let's not even think about it. But uh, the later versions of these had cartridges. They were proper cartridge-based consoles, and they were sold by Radofin and Acetronic, and they all had the same guts in them. Although the uh, cartridges weren't always cross-compatible, um, because some of them made the cartridges ports slightly different, because they were stupid and they smelled of whittles. Uh, Acorn Electron, that is literally an Acorn Electron, the world's shortest computer. Computer. Keyboard wasn't bad for the time. This was essentially a, a BBC computer, uh, which was made for the BBC back in the day. Very popular educational computer, but very pricey. This is a cut down version of it, basically. Uh, my friend Niall had one when we were growing up, and we used to play games such as Escape from Moonbase Alpha and uh, The Golden Figurine. That was another one. Citadel, I think, was out for this, which was good. Or was that BBC only? I don't know. Now I'm confused. But yeah, this came out, it would have been 1983, because um, it was slightly after the BBC B. Meant to be a huge selling computer over a long period of time, but nobody really had one. I, th I think that might be fibs. I honestly don't understand that. Unless they were all s sold to one man. Oh my god, this has got... Look at this! This has been hacked, right? And it's got, like, a headphone socket and a turbo or normal switch. My god, that's astonishing. Hang on, no, I think that, that... Was that always there on these? I can't remember. That switch is definitely something somebody's added. It wasn't a turbo function on the Electron standard, was there? That's fascinating. Might look into that later to see what they've done to it. This is a SAM interface for the SAM Coupe computer, which is an obscure British one, Miles Gordon Technologies. It presumably it adds interfaces to your SAM. That's fun, isn't it? Uh, here's something else that converts something into something. The joys. This is a Plus D system tape. Ah, so I'm presuming that is relevant to the Sam Coupe one, because it says on it Miles Gordon Technology. Uh, could be something to do with that. Oh yes, it is. Look, MGT. So it's another Sam Coupe expansion box. Makes sense. So here's something you don't see every day. This is a Miles Gordon Technology Sam Coupe, which is a 
do you know, I don't even know off the top of my head if it was an 8-bit or a 16-bit computer. It was kind of a weird cross between a ZX Spectrum and an Atari ST in the capabilities of it. And in fact, you could play the original 48K Spectrum games on it, but not the 128K games. Oh no, the emulator could not handle it. And it's a fascinating machine, just from a design point of view. It looks like a doorstop. In fact, there's not much else you can say to it, really. You've got one floppy disk drive at the front. Manic Miner, oh, the great version of Manic Miner, actually, for the Sam Coupe, and space for another one, but there isn't actually one in there, it's just kind of empty. But if you were to buy another floppy drive and install it, it would go in there. And nothing particularly exciting from the ports on the back, although it's got a SCART out, which was quite rare at the time. But yeah, it never caught on at all. I mean, really, it sold very, very few units. Uh, I don't even have one myself, because they go for like hundreds and hundreds of pounds, like £500 and above for a non-box one, last time I heard, so that's pretty crazy. An interesting fact about them, uh, I was determined to get a Sam Coupe game into my Terrible Old Games You've Probably Never Heard Of book, but I didn't because none of the games are bad enough. Seriously, we went through like the whole lot, me and somebody else, and there's, there's some pretty poor ones, but nothing really truly terrible. And a gentleman here at the museum informed me it's because Miles Gordon Technology themselves actually vetted the games before they could be released. So if it was really bad, it didn't get put out. Which is astonishing, really, considering the crap that, uh, you know, Nintendo and Sega and big companies like that shat out over the years, to think that little old Miles Gordon Technology didn't release anything truly awful. Pity their computer flopped harder than a whale on a diving board.